gentlemen. Uh, it is certainly a privilege to be here this evening and to, to have uh, our guest, Dr. MacDonald, with us. Uh, we'll tell, talk about him in a little while. But um, we haven't seen some of you for a while and others have not joined us yet. Um, this is the first uh, this is the first week since we have daylight saving time, so it probably have messed up some people's schedule. Um, so more will join us later, I'm sure. But um, others, we will have the recording and they'll be able to go back over the recording uh, during the week or whenever. And it's always a very good thing, profitable thing. Um, for for us to do. We are so happy to see some who we haven't seen for a little while. Dr. Patrickson, glad you made it in. And um and uh others. So we're going to go right in. It took a little time to settle. So we're going to write go right in. And uh we Ask, uh, let's see, Rudolph, you came in early, so we're going to ask you to lead us in prayer. Oh, well, okay, yes, you are, you are our guest, so we, we all right, here from the Netherlands. So all right, okay, uh, it will be a pleasure to do so. <laughs> all right, let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to meet as friends, talking together as friends. We look forward to the presentation by Dr. McDonald. It's a pleasure just to see some old friends, including my old boss, uh, Pastor Wellington, and um, others. And so we pray that this will be a wonderful sitting, albeit we are in different places, but bless us. And in a very special way, be Dr. McDonald as he presents. Give him wisdom, clarity, and grace as he shares with us. Please open our hearts and our minds to receive what he has prepared. And um, even those who are trying to get on, may you work it out for them, whether it's a difference with time zone or whatever the case may be. And as we create this memorable afternoon, we ask your blessings and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, talking is a very precious space where we express ourselves freely, clearly, and sometimes even controversially, but we remain friends. <laughs> and so it is always um, it is always a sought after place for some of us. Uh, for those who are new, it was a creation of co of COVID. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, Marcel, who is here with us this evening, was the prime mover, and we are appreciative of this. But this evening we have with us um, a very special guest. And Doc McDonald, what time is it over there where you are? It's now uh, approaching 10 o'clock. Uh, see, we, are, we haven't experienced a daylight saving. It will come at the end of the month. Then we'll uh, go forward one hour. So right now it's five hours ahead of Eastern time. So it's oh, 9.47. Okay. okay. Where is that? We really In, in Poland. I'm in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, home of my wife, uh, Evelina. So <laughs> this is her home, her home base. Okay. So we are very, we are very appreciative of the fact that you, after church and everything, you stay up uh, to be with us this evening, friends. Um, I have a, a introduction here that I can, I can choose from and read. I don't remember all of what is here, so let me just look on this paper. Um, Dr. Wilton McDonald is responsible for providing legal services to Cayman and the British Virgin Islands um, domicile funds, as well as several other jurisdictions. He has over 30 years of public accounting experience, financial services, and legal experience setting up over a thousand hedge funds and has worked closely with startups as well as blue chip investment fund managers 
Administrators Offshore Council, based primarily in the USA, United Kingdom, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Brazil, Hong Kong, China, UAE, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Russia, and Japan. Wilton has served as independent director and advisor for the alternative investment community as well. Wilton's investment fund practices has afforded him the opportunity to gain experience in general corporate partnerships, trust, commercial law, liquidation, as well as experience in securities, secure lending transactions, IPOs, stock exchange listings, and more. So for a background, he's an active fellow of ACCA in the United Kingdom since 2001. He was admitted to the bar in 2004 as an attorney barrister in the Cayman Islands, Jamaica, British Virgin Islands, and in 2002-2003 as an attorney in Connecticut and New York, USA. In January 2020, he was admitted to the role of foreign lawyers in the Republic of Poland. Now he has helped to grow several startup companies in various, uh, in Cayman and uh, elsewhere. Um, he built a, a U.S. 3.5 million practice at Truman Bodden Company, and that's in the Cayman Islands, and uh, has also em was also employed as an investment fund associate at Ogier and Lennox Patton in Nassau, Bahamas. Wilton completed a BSc BBA degree from Northern Caribbean University an MBA from Andrews University, a Bachelor of Laws with honors from the University College of London, master's degree, master of laws degree from Fordham Law School and completed the residence requirement for the Doctor of Juridical Science degree at Cornell Law School in New York. Dr. McDonald completed the Council of Legal Education certificate and obtained a certificate in company law from Université de Paris uh, and the Pantheon Chabonnet. Well, my French not good. He was awarded the Doctor of Business Administration degree in Rome, Italy in January 2020, and completed pre- and postdoctoral studies in finance and economics at two universities in Poland, including the Warsaw School of Economics. He has committed to lifelong learning and has completed postdoctoral research and executive leadership program, postdoctoral courses at said Business School, Oxford University, Harvard University. And so he has his, his first academic paper was published in 2004, Financial Accounting Standards, number 123, Accounting for Derivatives. Do the New York regulations decrease operating risk and prevent ultimate failure of banking institution in light of Basel Committee Capital Accord. I've said all of this, so he won't have to say it. And nowhere here have I seen uh, a degree in theology. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, he's not going to deal with, with law this evening. And that's interesting. Um, but I know he will do a, a, a good job, a capable job of presenting on the topic for the evening. The topic that he has chosen for the evening is, uh, let me get to it again, um, exploring the 6024-year Judeo-Christian timeline for humanity. 
6,024-year Judeo-Christian timeline for humanity. Doc, I'm anxious to hear this. <laughs> <clears throat> he has done a lot of research um, and has and is willing and ready to share some of what he has found uh, to us this evening. And so it is my pleasure to welcome you to Friends Talking, an open forum. Feel free to express yourself in any way. It's a judgment, non-judgmental free zone for all of us. And so, Doc, know you a long time. And I'm so happy to have you on this platform and to, to see you here. For though I think everybody here knows that his parents live in the Cayman Islands and Dr. Wilton MacDonald was president, treasurer and president of the Cayman Islands Conference. So we are I'm not surprised about the theological bent. <laughs> okay, God bless you. And we'll look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wellington. Thank you. And thank you everyone for having me on. Uh, delighted to, to be a part of this uh, group. Um, and uh, on my subject about 6,024 years, um, it, it breeds a lot of controversy. And I know that has come up in different circles. My presentation is going to be on point. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, will not try to introduce any, you know, things that you know, deter or, or, or is deviating from, from doctrines. And I know that the audience that I'm speaking to um, is primarily Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist. So the timeline and what's in this topic about 6,024 years, it's not an accurate, you know, number because the world has uh, adopted many calendars, Jewish calendars, R the Romans, um, uh, Gregorian today. And so we had a different calendars throughout time and accounting for time. But what's so special in it? And people would just, you know, say, why bother with it? And I say to them in response and to answer my own question, um, about the 6,024 years, you need an, an outline and you prepare any presentation in this one, or you have a degree, you have a paper to write, you have a skeletal outline, you need to have a roadmap. And the saying goes in order to see and determine where your, your, your future will be, a person will have to know their past, know their history. And so it is that I kind of was thrown into the deep end I am uh, not a scientist, uh, I'm not a theologian, but the amount of work that I've done in three years, it includes um, uh, growing a family tree that is approaching 620,000 members, compiling 3 million records, uh, examining, you know, uh, corpses and graves, uh, looking at for uh, far away places. I've been to 110 countries. Um, the Aborigines, I've met a few last summer. Uh, the Maori tribe in New Zealand, the Indians, and very curious to know about DNA in Africa. I've actually been to Africa four times. And on my last trip last year, I met a person. I think God really put this person in my path and he's on my Facebook. And anything that I'm talking now, you can also visit on Facebook, the blogs about um, uh, my uh, Geo Geo Christian uh, thoughts and I post on Facebook on a regular basis. And I met Philippe Stefani, African, Congolese, Malagasy, sixth generation African, and out of a billion, 1.4 billion people, this gentleman was a tour guide. I just thought, look, might as well just take his DNA. This is a fascinating place with Indians coming to Madagascar and accessing the East Coast of Africa. It's amazing. And I was blown away on this father's side. He matched a lot more Scandinavian, French, old French, Norman, Norman from Normandy, uh, Irish cousins in, in a 2000 sort of year period. Um, and that gels with me because I fit within the 6,000 year time frame. And, you know, there are a lot of skeptics because the polar opposite to a Judeo-Christian reckoning of time to help us understand the world. And a lot of subjects are interspliced and, and, and connected with this topic from archeology span to anthropology, to history, to microbiology, 
there's so many topics that will you know feed into this reckoning of time of human existence is who we are our culture everything about us and so i find that you know to address a lot of the topics and and, and questions that we'd have as human beings in a christian sense even it will help us to process and understand the world so what's the counter to this well the theory of evolution you know, 6,024 years, well, God created the world in approximately about 6,000 years ago. And those who disagree and follow the evolution theorist, we all know from Darwin, Charles Darwin, they believe that the, the humankind is millions of years. And I can't get a right, correct answer. I can't get one answer from them. On some sites, it's 200,000 years, others half a million years, and then a million. And I am disturbed by that, always troubled and disturbed. It's an existential sort of yearning. And I'm trying to figure out how do we reconcile? And my response to some of the skeptics was simply, I asked them a question, it puts, freezes them in the track. If you believe in this theory and you're taking God out of the equation because of some big bang and the folks at CERN in Switzerland, they're trying this experiment to collide particles at the speed of light, that's Failed. I haven't heard anything back from the CERN people, C-E-R-N, but out of chaos, you have order, they say. And I say to them, simple question, when God created the world, how old was the rock? How old was the tree? How old were these things? You can use carbon um, to, um, dating and testing to try and, and, and decipher, but how old? And if you have a flood event in 2400 B.C., 1600 years after the creation event, and it's the whole world just mixed up one giant washing machine. How can you separate created matter from other matters post-creation that came about on this earth? You can't, and it's difficult. So this sort of frees them in the tracks immediately. You can't answer that question because God would create something in his divine you know, knowledge and, 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 and his infinite power in its mature and prime existence and state. It could be 100,000 years old. So this question of 6,024 years, it's, it's about helping us to make sense of the world. And today we know that the world today is uh, on the border, I would say, of something great. People talk about AI and the next uh, thing that we will face. And I said, you know, more than ever, this is time to really dig down deep and read our Bibles and be connected to God. Because this is a time where even in the Cayman Islands, safe Cayman Islands, place that I relate as is home, they had the first public shooting. And uh, again, to answer why do we care about 6,024 years? Why do we care about the history? If we can't get these people help, immediate help, why not awaken a sense of morality and history in them that they can take on pride? We know a lot of the people turn to gangs and the world that we're living in, they, they turn to gangs for solutions. So to address them, to the problems that we have, we have major problems on all sides. I mean, cost of living, you name it, a lot of things. But to awaken a sense of moral, of decency and connectivity to the world, why not just share with them the truth about our history and help them understand where they're connected to the world. Because if these guys have nothing to live for and nothing to gain, they will just simply, they could just take your life. And this is something that we are faced with every day. Why 6,024 years? And growing up and having, and I was part schooled by my father, not a theologian that I am, but he is of 55 plus years. And I asked him, well, dad, um, who, who are God's people? And I, and I grew up even as part of Cole Porter and looking at the books from the General Conference and looking at the pictures there. And Cayman Islands would be an interesting place to live in because you have uh, two distinct groups. You have the expatriates and you have the locals. And some people say, well, you have a crack and some people fall within the crack. Well, I sort of fell in the crack within the crack. <laughs> And that's something that 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 with my family. So you know, again, the the polar opposite and where you belong in Cayman. These questions asked. Well, who who are the 
the, the Jews too, the Jewish people, who's God's people, who are God's people? And these are the yearning questions that I just asked myself, asked my father. I had little answers back. And even if you look at God's people, the Jews, I said, but why would even a man like Hitler be after the Jews when, honestly, they look more Aryan than, than Hitler with his black hair? I had these burning questions and I can't get answers. I couldn't get answers. Who, who, and, and so it is that we, we, um, we have to devise and look at, at primary sources. We have to look at the world in which we live in. And as far as, as I, I could see it, is that um, we need to revisit the reckoning of time. In uh, our world today, we have scholars like Uriah Smith who have come up with um, this timeline. At law school in 1998, when I was 23 years old, I went down, I took the Bible and the old King James Bible, King James Version Bible, with the annotations there of the dates and references. And I went through the chapters trying to look at, you know, the generations according to the synoptic, synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Luke, Mark, John. So we look through it and go through the Gospels. And I count that there are about 60 to 64 generations that separated Adam from the Christ. And I just had a fun exercise doing this. And for me, it gave me comfort. Like I was connected to the scriptures. I was connected in a way that this came alive. It made sense to me. And a lot of the, and, and if I could just say one, one highlight about what the 6,024 years, what it is, it was the most powerful evangelistic tool there is because I lived it. I was going to church, yes. I was going to church because, yes, I was mandated to. But at some point in my life, as a youngster, I decided to go for my own reasons. As any individual, an adult and young person would, you know, you know. But that exercise in law school, first year, doing difficult subjects and taught by people who are not Christians, are not Adventists. But I went down in my own sort of man cave at law school, and that's what really started me on this journey of time reckoning, of trying to figure out the world and having it make sense to me. So uh, Uriah Smith did that. I was able to just do it at law school to map out 60 to 64 generations and the reckoning of the 4,000 year gap to Christ. And so the rest of it then um, from there is pretty, pretty easy, but it's convoluted and it's been distorted. Um, I wanted to really present again my uh, again research and what I've found and at the base of my uh, discussion um, and, and so it is and I see that the world today it is prepared for the the end the close um, I don't know if people have been following and the Daniel Revelation prophecy as well I will just digress a little bit but things are in motion in place for the end of days um, I followed the European Union, the start of the Maastricht in 1992, and how it progressed in the Treaty of Amsterdam in 97, and more recently, before Brexit, uh, the 2009 Treaty in, in Lisbon. And there it created a separate entity in law, a separate entity which is separate from its members. So it doesn't matter if they have Frexit, Nexit, after Brexit, doesn't matter. The institutions are in place. The new monetary system called special drawing rights issued by the IMF, or it could be the World Bank, but SDRs are they're called, the acronym. The new monetary system is in place. They just need for the dollar to collapse and everything is a go. So in our Daniel revelation, we know the image so clearly and well. And of the head of gold and uh, the, uh, the, the bust of silver and legs of brass and feet of iron and then toes of iron and clay. We need to put this in proper perspective. And so it is in a reckoning time and a timeline that I purchased some old books and I encourage everyone to read. And there are books talking about Daniel and the image and down into the 10 toes. Uh, there are books written, Harvard. And uh, again, I can you know make reference to it. Um, Procopius, and it's from the Loeb Classical Library. 
and Harvard University Press. This book was published in 1914. It's over 100 years old. And it talks about the Vandalic Wars. And the wars, um, we all know clearly that there were Germanic tribes from history that defeated Rome. And Rome fell around the 5th century AD. And it describes in here the people um, and, and, and how they looked, looked like. Well, there are some inconsistencies about the Gothic people, the Vandals themselves, but referring to Moors. And what it is, and strikingly in the back of this book, it references other uh, contributors. My favorite would be Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, a lawyer, a scholar, a historian, and someone who um, lived, uh, was born in AD 50, after the uh, death of Christ, uh, Tacitus was a historian, and he chronicled a lot of the history of mankind. And he wrote extensively about the people of the, of the world. Back then, population was between, you said, 200 and 300 million. Yes, this, this, they, have, they had a census, maybe it's not as sophisticated, was not as sophisticated as today, but roughly 200 to 300 million. And he wrote about mankind and humankind. He wrote about the uh, Celts, the Picts in Scotland, that they were black, but almost all of his books are missing. And this is a book that references one of the books of Tacitus. And it talks about, earlier on, I was saying that I had questions, existential questions for my dad. Who were the um, Jews? Who were God's people? I guess I'm looking at the Review and Herald images and I'm seeing mostly white people. So everyone's white then. And again, I'm married to a white woman for 19 years and I'm supposedly genetically 10% white. I am not here to put down on any race. I, I am three races in one. My mom is Indian, proud of it. I love her to death. My dad is mixed. But this is something that gripped me. I went through Ellen White as a boy in, in her studies and I respect her as a, one of the founders of the Adventist church. But as it portrayed in recently in my blogs and Facebook, which I encourage one to visit, she appeared was biracial. Medic cards shows that she was mixed race. And it seems that she was then seemingly exiled in her latter years in Australia. She was talking about the equality of blacks. There are records there. And I questioned, I said, well, what other books would exist? The Adventist Church was formed just 20 years after the abolition of slavery. Was it viewed in their eyes? But Ellen White is a figure to me. Um, but you know how I understand the pictures, every material that is penned with Ellen White, it's a picture of mostly Caucasian white looking people. And, and that's how it presents. It made me feel in a country that I grew up in, stateless legally, for 26, had it not been for smart decisions my father made in real estate, I don't know where I'd have been, 10 universities attended. I thank God for his divine help. Because as I said, I lived in the crack within the crack in the Cayman Islands because of the divide between expatriates, which are mostly white, and locals. And the locals too were, I'll say, they mostly are say, mixed to people, but those who get the better jobs and those who get the offices would be of the lighter persuasion. And I leave it as, as that. But this is the, the world that I lived in and faced and color dictated and was a part of my life. And so the pictures and images that we see and even of Jesus, and I would just again, share a screen and just to show you. And today we have even in, uh, the modern day, we have images now, people who are telling us what Jesus looked like. And I'm sharing screen with you. This is a compilation. This is a composite sketch by the National Geographic. This is nothing of the images that I saw growing up as a boy, day in and day in out. And another image of Adam, National Geographic. It's not something that uh, Africans or black people put together, but these are images. And I can show you one that you may not have seen before of Christopher Columbus. And you will jump up and say, what? Christopher Columbus? But he was Italian. Yes, but, uh, and this was actually commissioned 
in the 18, uh, uh, say, 30s and 20s, between 20s, 30s. But this particular um, uh, image um, was uh, commissioned by a Scottish historian, and Arthur Cadwan is from Wales. But it's, it's not something from Africa. It's not of African or Black uh, origin or design. But all of these composite uh, photos and, and paintings and, and, and busts of Jesus Christ, of Adam, of Christopher Columbus, and he took his voyage in 1492, um, of Black people. And uh, there are uh, essays and articles, and I don't understand how the Black scholars today have not brought this to our attention. I don't understand if it's corruption. We know we live in a world and it's rife with corruption. And But uh, for me, uh, there is that um, Ben Franklin essay, and I encourage everyone to read it. In 1751, good old Ben, whose face is on the $100 bill, he uh, made clear that the world in the 1700s was black, was mostly black, almost entirely black. And if you want to quote, and go look at the quote, it's paragraph 24 of his essay. It's not a long essay, it's probably three pages, and it's an open archives, open internet. It's Ben Franklin's essay on the observations on the increase of mankind. And in that uh, year, the population of the world was about 600 million. So, uh, my timeline and references from the time of Christ when the population was 200 to 300 million, when Ben wrote this essay talking about the world being mostly black, and it says it in clear language, and that was 1751. Then further on in the year uh, 1900, when the Victorian era had come to an end and the Industrial Revolution just took off, that population was around global 1.7 billion people. And today, the population is at 8 billion, as we know. And of that, the United Nations makes clear that the percentage of whites, the non-whites, 12%, 88%. So this is not a discourse about just race, but race impacts our view of the world. It impacts our lives. It's the reason why a lot of people today make $5 an hour and other people would make $1,000 an hour. It affects our lives and dealing with prices and issues. I said in one blog to 8 billion people are literally paying for the, 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 the fuel that goes into the jets of the top 1,000. And this is the, the world, the insolvent world that we live in. And it's insolvent by all measures and standards. I'm both a lawyer and an accountant. And I have done my doctorate on derivatives. And I understand the concept of leverage and financial gearing. And the world is bankrupt. My reckon is about 50 times over because of the gross value of derivatives to GDP. And that's the world that we are inheriting. So what we could do is awaken into our kids and grandkids and the next generation a sense of our real history. And this is where I think this is what connects and what I'm trying to present here is uh, a, a, a sort of call for everyone to look at this timeline and try to come up with the primary sources. Um, and how they can um, have the world sort of make sense to them. Because based on the numbers alone, um, I picked up this book, which is 100 years old. It, talk, it spoke about the Vandalic Wars. We know the Vandals were one of the tribes, the Germanic tribes to defeat Rome. And in the timeline, that Daniel and Revelation timeline is a very clear timeline from BC 600, where the rise of Babylon, to the end of the for the 476 to 500 AD when Rome fell, defeated by the Vandals. And this book talks about the Vandalic Wars and the peoples, and it mentions about how the Moors were very dominant, but also it references the one tribe, the, 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 the Getic people or the Gothic people who lived near the Ister River. And that connects Germany, the Danube, the, to Ukraine. So it, it's, a, it's a river that runs around. The people were, of course, coming from the Caucasus, 
And as I said before, like coming from the Caucasus uh, region, the mountains, not modern day Turkey. And, and this book talks about their features, about fair hair, tall, handsome, and it re refers to the Aryan. But it's referencing the work of Tacitus. And this is where we as scholars and students, we're all students of the Bible. We need to look and say, well, if this is if this if this referencing Tacitus and 20 books of Tacitus declared missing, but they found Germania, and that was pretty much the Nazi Bible. I mean, Germania was a book that they supposedly found in the house of a Italian noble during World War II. How credible is that? This to me begs all of us to just challenge sources. So in this book, it's talking about the beautiful um, uh, and lovely uh, race of the Aryans. And it's it's coming and, and it's referring to Tacitus and his works, but most, all of his books are missing. He's describing the black people of, of the earth, of the Celts, of Europe. And uh, it, it's shocking that they found one book but all the others they can't uh, find. Just like Euphorus in Greece, ancient Greece, 300 BC. We know it because we look at the Daniel Revelation prophecy, we look at the timeline, and we see that clearly there is a uh, sort of a reckoning of time between Persia and Rome, where Alexander the Great, whose kingdom um, today, if you see all the movies as portrayed, it's usually people who are not of color. And, and so we, we have to challenge, I think, um, the, the, the current narrative that goes against the current 6,000, 24 year sort of period in our, in our history. And everything that we are doing, I think, in, in, in sort of, um, you know, in, in life, I think this is something that we all need to do and challenge. So, so what it is, if I could come up with a timeline of events, and I've made it clear. Let me share with you um, some of my thoughts on what I think um, the, the time uh, frame for humanity has been. Um, if you go back in time, the timeline, we could see that we were talking about creation. But what happened before creation? There was a great war in heaven, the start of the great controversy. And that, to me, I wanted to present to you my timeline and reckoning of time. And so great war in heaven, and this, pre, um, this, this happened, uh, you know, again, before, so they call it pre-creation, pre, pre and um, the, the devil and his angels were thrown out. And I said to myself, what maybe caused this to happen? There are other sources. I refer only to another extra biblical sort of source, um, Enoch. I know some people may not regard it, but it was found in the scrolls at Qumran at uh, BC uh, 3, BC 4. But uh, this sort of reckoning of time and pre uh, sort of creation, it's I asked another question to my father. I said, what caused the angels to side with Lucifer? We don't know. These questions, we don't know. But could it be that um, the devil, the Satan's angels, uh, Satan pulled a race card. Oh, you know, God it, it made creation. You know, the black Adam in his image. We are not like him and side with me because I am for you and I am going to you know, help you. I'm one of you, my brothers. He persuaded one third of the angels to go with him and they were cast from heaven. And uh, following the controversy and he's cast down, man, and we know that uh, ma mankind was, 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 was created. We know that God created Adam from the, from the earth. So he was a person um, of, of color. And, and that's not clear in the, we'll say mainstream, but now scientists like National Geographic, they're describing him as a person of color. Um, the flood event. So this is again sticking to my timeline and reckoning of time. The great flood in 2400 BC, and that's 1600 years after creation. And we're told, uh, again, I only cite one um, extra sort of biblical book, that's uh, Enoch. And on the extra biblical books, 
I encourage every scholar and person listening here to look at this. In my work and reckoning of time and looking at um, the Bible and how it was produced, a black Stuart King James <clears throat> in 1611, he was instrumental in producing the Bible. Yes, black Stuart King. And all the Stuart Kings in England were black. And the Bible was uh, 80 books and the same 80 books made it through from the scrolls at Qumran about 2000 years ago to the Council of Nicaea and it made it through all the way to James at 611, 1611. What powers prevented the rest of the Pepcrophal books to be taken out? Well, I looked it up, and apparently the UK, which has the patent to the Bible universally, the government of the UK passed laws in the 1800s that would make it uh, prohibitively expensive for the publishing houses to publish the full Bible and uh, some of those um, uh, publishing houses, they were in, they, they were of course sponsored to by by lodges, by Maso they had Masonic figures, but they were not allowed to publish the full Bible. It was costly. The Bible got whittled down to sixty six books, and today the Ethiopians and the Ethiopian Christians have the full eighty book Bible. So here it is. We have uh, the record of the uh, flood in twenty four hundred. I uh, surmise that there was the, the Nephilim, and again, it's a controversial subject. How is it that the DNA, you have that races were that come about? Um, certainly, there was uh, some mixing, whether it was the antediluvians experimenting with DNA matter, because they were that brilliant, and they could have done it in their industrialized cities. How it came about, we don't know that a lot of those giants were lost during the flood. And Noah apparently was the only person who was not of color of the eight on the ark. And during and after the flood event, the world changed. The canopy cover dissipated. The world was ravaged like nuclear bombs had gone off. The methane was high in the air. And people changed. Genes mutated. Um, and one person who is a Christian scientist that I borrow from and, and have learned from was Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. I encourage people to look at the book, his book called Traced. And he's looked at how the Y chromosome has mutated over the last five to 6,000 years. So Dr. Jensen is a proponent and he supports that timeline of 6,000 years. Um, and so after the flood event, people uh, moved around, but you know, the great hunter Nimrod around BC 2200, he constructed Babel and his people, the languages were conf confounded, God scattered the people um, from that event. BC 2000, from the pyramids and ancient Samaria, uh, clear evidence that even giants depicted in paintings carrying elephants, or at least that one elephant on their back and yokes, were depicted in paintings, and people were largely brown, and all mostly brown in complexion. These are the people of ancient Egypt around BC 2000. And then the great exodus. Some argue when that happened. People, I, I would say BC 1500, and those that were of color, black Jews and Hebrews, would have left uh, Egypt. And when they went into the uh, promised land, we know, again, hinting at the giants, they were exclaiming, the people there, are, it's like we are like grasshoppers. If you were you're five foot, I'm five feet a few inches, five foot nine. And if I'm standing beside Shaquille O'Neal, who is seven foot, I wouldn't consider myself to be a grasshopper. But if it's someone who is 20, 30, as they even speculate, 40 feet, I would look up and say, yes, I am a little grasshopper. So it is, we have to understand a perspective about giants and their existence. And it was exclaimed, the people were scared they, before they went into Jericho and the walls of Jericho came crashing down. But that's another biblical re document report of giants. BC 1000, the reign of a black, and I stress black King David. Now in my work as a, 
grassroots layperson genealogist, I can see a connectivity to the Davidic line. The surnames that come up from my research all over the world, as I said, traveled 110 countries, and I have about 80 kits that I manage. There are different groups called haplogroups, and most of those companies are surprisingly owned by modern-day Jews. <laughs> From family tree DNA to Weifel to Ancestry, 23andMe, mostly. Those are owned. And, and they are owned today. They're owned um, and controlled. So, but, but you still have to test nonetheless. So my grouping is E. According to Dr. Jensen, haplogroup E is the first haplo of the, uh, of, of, of the world, of the Black uh, um, uh, society or, or, or patriarchal society that we have come from, haplogroup E. And that's a, a DNA box. That is what you're assigned as a human being. They give you a box to check. And a lot of people don't get into the science about haplogroups, but it's just a group. A, letters A through E are supposedly African. I just call them to be that they're of black origin and everything else above that. My mother, mother's, for example, is an M. My wife is an H. My wife's father is an R. And it goes all the way up to Z, but the A through E, and it doesn't go in order, not alphabetical order. It's ranging between E and it leapfrogs to uh, A and then B and C and D, and then it goes into non-Black categories. I, my surname from McDonald, from Scotland, True McDonald son of a black person, son of Donald, uh, connected to uh, the Davidic line through the name, surname Yaya. That's Y-A-H-Y-A. This is John or Johannes, depending if you're looking at Yiddish or Arabic. So I, am D I have five connection points on my DNA uh, Y chromosome, male Y. And, and that's proven in my research for three years. So it's, I call it ancient Hebrew. I don't even go into the Jewish labels because who is a modern day Jew? I can't even get into it because it's confusing. I, I said it's confusing. I said, I mean, um, it, it's very confusing. Why would even Hitler have a problem with the, the, with the Jews if they, he, he even looked uh, mixed race for me, Hitler. But again, that's a question for another, another time. In the timeline from BC 1000, King David and Solomon, we have BC 600. And that's the reign, as we know, of the great golden kingdom of Babylon. We know Nebuchadnezzar, he was out there in the pasture for seven years. God taught him a lesson. The walls of Babylon, so tall that about seven or so chariots could have been ridden on the walls of Babylon, modern day um, Iraq. 450 BC, great Persian empire. That was also a black empire. Contrary to the movies, you know, the movies with 300, the 300 movies that uh, they have a couple of them. Um, and then 300 BC, Alexander the Great. They're about to release another film about Alexander. I named my son after uh, this uh, famous person of Greece. There were black people, ancient Greece. BC 150, Rome, and the rise of the uh, Silk Road connecting China and Asia to, uh, to, to, to the West. And Rome started around BC 150. Then BC zero, the birth of the great redeemer. And uh, the population, remind you, is about 200 to 300 million back then. So when people talk about a much bigger- uh, That guy is boys, where does it sound like? Where is it sound like he's from? Uh, sir. Sorry, okay. Um, eh? Alton, you need to mute. It's not like what? Jarvis. Oh, it's not like Jarvis. Oh. Alton, you need to mute. Sorry. And um, so the, the, the birth of the great redeemer when the population is just 200 to 300 million. And thereafter, 8300, we have the expansion of the great Roman Empire and the development of the Silk Roads to China. We had minority settlement, 
very minor settlements of whites living in the Caucasus Mountains. That's modern day Turkey and Uzbekistan. Then we fast forward to AD 470, the rise of the Vandalic Germanic tribes. I encourage you can go and purchase this book. It's called Procopius, History of the Wars, and they're multi volumes. This is an interesting book, but as I said, be careful that they reference, I think, a spurious work of Tacitus and something that you can hold in your library about the Vandalic Wars. So the Vandals were one of the tribes that defeated Rome. And we're talking about the 400 AD period. Then AD 500, we have the conversion now from the pagan Rome to the papacy. And AD 600 to AD 1400. And stay with me because I am just giving you my humble timeline of the world and why it's so important to understand and process and research this for yourselves. So AD 600 to AD 1400 is the expansion of the Black African and Black European cities. A lot of the Black African cities were destroyed over time. And today, people, they're parts of Africa. Look at that, visited four times, Uganda, Kenya. They have modern cities today, but a lot of the ancient kingdoms have been destroyed just like the nose and the lips have been taken off and lopped off of the great sphinx in Egypt, distorting our history when it's really a black history. And a lot of those, Alexandra, I would have loved to go to Alexandra, Egypt, founded by Alexander the Great. And that library and city was destroyed. It contained so much information about our past. And then, Again, fast forward to AD 1066, they claim William of Normandy from France coming over. Most likely it was a black person. Ben Franklin, most of the people living pre, pre 1700s were black. The population now stood at maybe 400 million persons, 500 million maximum. We got a limited population. And the images that we see in museums today, they question them. Even there is an image in the Aust Austrian parliament house of Tacitus with a noble look. And he's, you know, having his fist under his chin. And that was created most likely in the last 150 years. But it depicts someone who is of a white Caucasian background. Tacitus lived 2,000 years ago. He was a black man. The stories of St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day literally just went. It was celebrated about a day or two ago. Now, order. he cleared the snakes away from Ireland. Ireland doesn't have snakes. Who is he killing? The pigs? We know the pigs of UK vanished. They were, they were, they were gone just suddenly. When did it happen? Well, I could trace back in my family tree to Kenneth McAlpine in 900 uh, AD. And he was one of the last Pictish kings. And when the Picts were removed from the scene, because you had some invading whites, whenever that happened, the inter inter interplay of the church, it happened about a thousand years ago. St. Patrick was to clear away the snakes when Ireland had no snakes. The great discovery of the new world, 1492. In 1492, a black Columbus. And how do we know this? Well, there is a painting of him. There's, uh, there are other sources. And even the persons that he met, there's tons of sources coming out that the people who Columbus, a black Columbus saw in the new world were also black and of color. They were the local Aborigines. And he came there um, in 1492, in the 1500s, he had several voyages, and we have the Olmecs, the people of uh, the stone heads with the flaring noses and broad and thick lips. We need to look at the signs. All of these things are clear as to the history. Then 1500s AD, Tudor Kim Kingdom, Henry VIII, and now his bones are tossed around. They've been moved about 10 times. By, by different authorities. Why? He doesn't want to be tested. The Tudor king, who was he? We know of the stories of the uh, Cromwell and Oliver Cromwell and Thomas Cromwell, the ancestor, 
who destroyed black icons and relics to make way for the Church of England. And in the 1500s, we also had the Great Reformation and the split with the Catholic Church and the rise of the Protestants, race and religious wars. But race was very much a part of the picture as well. And the, all of the artwork and medieval art was created. 1611, back to my favorite monarch, King James of England, he commissioned the Bible to be translated to English, in English for the first time. And Charles I, he was a black king. His son was called Charles II, the black boy. Why? Was he an extra dark in complexion? No. But the murders happened during this period in Europe. The Jacobites were slaughtered and scattered. I have connectivity to the Jacobites. My name, MacDonald. And I was searching for my name. And I'm really with a 95% confidence level that it is connected to this diaspora, to the diaspora of England and the uh, fleeing Jacobites during the 1600s. And this is not ingrained in modern history, but it, people are starting to take another look at this take on history. And in 1751, I want to stick with the timeline. We have the Ben Franklin essay, but I encourage people to read on the observations of the increase of mankind. The population again was 600 million, went from 200 to 300 million from the time of Christ to 600 million. How could there have been a, a much bigger and wider timeline? Why are scholars and the most enlightened amongst us do not follow and examine the timeline. It is so clear and makes sense that if you're going from 200 million to 2000 years ago to the Ben Franklin essay where the population was 600 million to 1900 where the population is 1.7 billion and today the population is 8 billion of which 12% are white. How could the images be correct? How can this be allowed to be perpetuated for the next generation? While there's their inequities and they're, they're on every side, when we walk into a room for the first time, we are judged. We are, we are, we are, scrutiny is put on us. Are you good enough? You're of color. Where are you from? These things matter and they should be talked about, not in a way to exact any retribution, we are equal at the foot of the cross, but we need to right the wrongs and we need to correct the history for the next generation. And during this period, as I say, 1751 during Ben Franklin, the supposed slave trade was going on. I know this, start, this strikes controversy with some, but there are videos and I can look at my Facebook wall. There's evidence of Americans, black Americans, coming out, that they are the Indians. Even James Baldwin, in 1966, he had a, a, a speech at Cambridge University, and he, he was presenting, he said, the black people of America are the Indians. Um, so what about the slave trade? Why hasn't it been talked about? You're bringing people in from 12 million, millions of Africans. I went to Africa, unlike Alex Haley, he had to pay out of court set settlements. I don't buy it. And his uh, visit to, to Africa, I, I don't buy the story. Maybe people, some people came, but not in the manner in which described. And that we have to challenge for ourselves. The 1800s, I call it the, the, the period of great scrubbing. Black people and black things. Just to eliminate and scour and call it whitewashing, for lack of a better term, whitewashing. 1844, it's a period of great disappointment with the Millerites and Baptists. And they were disappointed. They thought Christ was coming. Also in the 1800s, the great scrub of the books of the Bible. Why do we not research this for ourselves? Why the canon from 
2,000 years ago got whittled down to 66 books, yet we accept this, we need to, to, to visit it. But I did research on it. As I said, I saw the Act of Parliament, which forced publishing houses from publishing the full Bible. That was done in the 1800s. The 1900s was a period of great uh, progress with Industrial Revolution. A lot of Black people didn't get credit for patents. We all know the stories of Thomas Edison. Did he create the light bulb? There's so many stories, untold stories, that their Blacks couldn't own anything, but they still contributed to the progress of the planet. The 1930s saw the Great Depression, and this is reminiscent of what's going to come again. And the uh, collapse, of the financial collapse that's coming 1939 to 1945, the rise of Nazi Germany. And I don't know what to think about this, really, because I've visited um, Auschwitz in Poland. I live in Poland, and I've visited about 10 times. I have family that visited uh, me, and I take a trip and go to Auschwitz. There are many pictures of people who were the camp um, you know, uh, victims, and they are displayed on the walls. But there, there's a growing report of the so-called gypsies, and persons of color who were ethnically cleansed and killed and gassed. And they would gas them, kill them, spread, her, spread the ashes in the rivers. It's hard to tell exactly how many people and persons died. And I asked the question, I go back to my father, why did even Hitler have it out for the Jews? They even look more Aryan than, than he did. And this was a, an opportunity for further ethnic cleansing and wipe, wiping out whatever minorities existed, I believe, in Europe at the time. And it was clear, even from Africa, they gathered people. There's only the Gibraltar Straits separating Spain from Northern Africa. Remember that, just a few miles away. They, in 1987, you have the great uh, crash of Wall Street. We all remember that, Black Monday and Black even the terminology, Black Monday, Black Friday, the Webster's dictionaries, they have played with words. And again, I appeal why the scholars have not brought this to attention. A brunette was described, many presidents' wives were brunettes. A brunette was a woman who was of brown complexion, but they changed that in the dictionaries. And we accept that. And color, they made black evil, uh, everything that you could think about, not, not lacking, white is pure and innocent, and black is evil, of the devil. And the, the words have been described and defined in such a manner, even the word, the N-word, Niger, means in the Yoruba language, God, authority. It the, did not exist before Noah Webster added an extra G, and we accept that to demean and just bring ourselves down. I, 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 I just grapple with it, how this was not uh, told. So Black Monday, the great Wall Street crash of 1987. The 92, the birth of the European Union. And that started the latter part of the Daniel Revelation prophecy, which is ticking. 92 was the Maastricht Treaty. The European Union was born. Then 2008, the Great Recession, an election of the Obama, first black president. But was he? The jury is out. I, again, have evidence. There are books not available on Amazon talking about the black who huge or not. President uh, Washington was black and of color. Lincoln was black. Most of the founding fathers in the U.S. were black and of color. Even the fighting king, the mad King George III of England in the 1700s, it was basically one black fighting another. That is the real history. And that's not been told to us. But this is what, uh, based on my tracing, my family tree with all the royals and vips, most of them don't disclose. They're not obligated to disclose their DNA. But I have triangulated matches where I have reasonable comfort in uh, what I've found, what I've discovered, and that they are of African ancestry as well, because uh, they would connect to the ancient Scots. 
they would connect to the ancient line, the black line of Stuart Kings. And they too would have black DNA. Even the Spencer line. I, I had a match the other day with two members from the Princess Diana's line, the Spencers. And one of them was so bold to say, hey, we come from Romani gypsies. We come from the Caucasus. Now, I love my wife to death, and I have done all her samples. I have one member to test in her family. But they are of the DNA type R and H, which is the Caucasus. And they're geographically close to the Caucasus region. And again, I have profound love for her, 19 years of married to her. And the way that the Moors describe their books and I, 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 if anything that you missed on this presentation, you could go to my Facebook. There's uh, books, there's Said of Andalusu, and he wrote 1,000 years ago about the invading whites. Their bellies protrude. And it's something that I have to read to you to, 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 so that you get uh, the picture of what, the extent of what uh, Said from Andalusu said 1,000 years ago. And this is describing persons who came from the Caucasus just 700 to 900 years ago, because their numbers are very small. And he says that um, by nature, they are unthinking. No, first, let me go in the first quote. They are nearer animals than men. Again, I'm not making any racist remarks, but I don't know how the leaders didn't catch this. But Said from Andalusa, and I have provided quotes and sources online, and it, it was documented in 1029, but it's mostly in Arabic. They're nearer animals than men. By nature, unthinking, and their manners crude. Their bellies protrude. Their color is white. Their hair is long. In sharpness and delicacy of spirit, intellectual perspicacity, they are nil. Ignorance, lack of reasoning, boorishness are common amongst them. And that's chronicled. That's in the history books. That's a fact. Other sources which vanished spoke about them coming over by Moors. They were taken as slaves, placed in harems. The woman, men worked as slaves. As far as 1300 AD, I tried to go and I revisit the sources and the sources have left. I saw the source and it mentioned, and one other more source said that their bodies were weak, their skin loose, and they traveled to travel medium distances. They were sleeping on horseback and describing whites coming over from the Caucasus. They were weakened, could not make it over. So the images of the fighting Vikings, and I start watching the Viking series on Netflix. It's great. Ivor the Boneless and all these figures. And we are blasted by Hollywood and the drama. And this is the actual accounts. Folks, we need to read, read, get more involved in books outside of the English language, because some of these sources are not available. Like the book that talked about George Washington being a tall, swarthy colonel. He was referred to a colonel before he became president, and a general, then president, was a black man. He was dark. Even of Napoleon Bonaparte of France, the French elite were black. Napoleon was described by lover's letters, lover's letters as black man. And there's a portrait hanging in the National Gallery in London, which I have access to and I got a copy of, and he's of a black man. And we take things for granted. And in my DNA studies, I was able to find so many sources. The Sinclairs opened up graves in Westmoreland. The Sinclair family from Scotland arrived in Jamaica in the 1700s. They are of type haplogroup E, that's African, that's my group. The former governor general, Berkeley, as they say, Barclay, born in 1785, son of UK Admiral Bar Barclay, is of haplogroup E. Same thing as the Savage, that's a surname, MacDonald, Hamilton, and my name is really MacDonald. 
that you, you know, because I have cousins and I have other people who are of type E who told me. There's a guy who was on Facebook called Orit. He's a musician. He's my dad's age. He also remembers and recalls, and this is it, guys, above all, all the sources. My dad remembers at age seven singing very old Jacobite songs. His father was singing them. Bonnie Blue, Yonder, Bonnie Bray. They remember, these men in Jamaica remember singing these songs. Orit MacDonald and how he wrote his name, M, small c, with a line underneath. That denotes a missing letter. The old form of MacDonald means son of Donald or son of Dub, son of a black man, Jacobite, black, Scott. Then it's a missing letter. This, the Irish version would be MC, just like in the burgers. Today you have the burger places, which is not even owned by any one group because it's a multinational corporation. But the McDonald's, the two founders um, who sold out their interests many years ago um, from a guy called Ray Kroc, but neither here nor there. They were from Ireland. They're Irish Americans. But McDonald's Scottish is M-A-C Donald. That's my name. But, you know, got registered as MC with a line underneath the C. Hamilton, Brereton, and those are haplo group E's. My African haplo, they call it Afro black, and I don't want to use the word African because today out of 20,000 DNA matches, I have two matches that uh, bear on African connectivity. The person I found in Madagascar, Philippe Stefani, he is more Norman and French and Italian and Scandinavian than he is African. I don't buy the African diaspora story. Yes, Africans came uh, to the New World, but not in the manner described. They would not have lived for two weeks on a boat, a sailboat. It could not happen. It just could not. And I've spoken to doctors and Navy persons. You really would have to be questioned your intellect or your morality, if you buy that story. It, 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 it's sad. Other haplogroup E's would include Einstein, supposedly the smartest man in the world. Einstein was a haplogroup E. Um, you had the Wright brothers. And even before the Wright brothers, you had other people who conceived flight in America, but got no credit. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, who I told you was black, the French general, he's type E. All the kings and pharaohs of Egypt would be of type E. And one, Tutankhamun, King Tut, I have my doubts about because they did a bust of King Tut. They mean the scholars. And he looks like Prince William. Hmm, interesting. He looks like Prince William, the next king of England. That's very credible. Um, and he, they said he's type R. <clears throat> For me, all the uh, kings were E from Egypt. Um, Hitler, even nasty and bad Hitler, was type E. Not an Aryan. I don't even know what Aryan. Aryan is an invented phrase in phraseology, but um, type E. And lots of people, Mandela, Nelson Mandela was an E. President Woodrow Wilson was an E. And I dare venture that Abraham Lincoln was an E. George Washington was not only black, but E was an E as well. E is a black person, just like letters A, B, C, D. I went to New Zealand again, as I said, in a Maori tribe. There are two people that I sampled there. One was a type O. O is Meso-Indian, Chinese. That's typical of the region. But the chieftain, John Petuya, he turned out to be a haplogroup C. And C is of African origin, letters A through E. And he was a chieftain. He's in an old nurse's nursing home, has his senses. He's a chieftain, Indian on the outside, but black DNA on the, in, on, on the, on the inside. Um, so I've, I've digressed a bit, but I want to just touch on the last bit of the timeline as I race towards the ending and the end finishing line. The birth of the, so I spoke about Black Monday, the great Wall Street crash of 1987. 92, about the birth of the European Union. 
This ties into the Daniel Revelation prophecy. 2008 was a great recession and our supposedly first black president in the States, when probably it's about the fourth or the fifth black president anyway. And then 2009, the great birth of the true autonomous European Union, the Treaty of Lisbon, where the European Union became a autonomous thing, a organism, a state. Even if you have a next exit, Frexit, Nexit, doesn't matter. They have a solid body which continues in existence beyond its constituent members. Um, AD 2020, the great lockdown. We all know, experience it. We could come, it could happen again, COVID-19. 2022 was an interesting year during the end and aftermath of COVID. A lot of the oligarchs were trying to explore space and they're still trying to colonize the planet. And I have a feeling that they don't want to be around when things go awfully wrong. Um, but, you know, the bunker idea, not going to work. You still need food after three months or six months and someone's going to know where you're at. But they want to go off planet. And uh, the uh, billionaire um, from Virgin, uh, Branson pulled out and Elon Musk's rocket, you know, test rocket blew up. But that's the uh, another point in history. And artificial intelligence. Now, I have this little bit to say about art artificial intelligence. It can create jobs, but it's going to displace a lot of workers. And who's going to be impacted by AI? Brown and black people and minorities, because they hold a lot of the low end jobs. For me, true AI being a former programmer, because of all the accomplishments to know, and I thank Dr. Wellington for you know elaborating on the CV, but I was a programmer as well, with about 40,000 miles of neurons stretched out. There's no way to achieve true AI. And if that machine is too smart for its liking, it's probably a demon in that box. And, and there's no way around that. There's no way to get, achieve true AI because body plus breath equals living soul. We all know that as theologians, we know that as Christians, and to achieve this in a box, it's only God can really breathe upon that and make it alive or mimic life. So be careful about AI. And uh, I think what's coming now as far as the great world economy and the new world economy, we have to be uh, we have to be a part of it. How do we relate to it? We have all these disasters happening and inequities and inequalities. This is where we have to take the message to all persons, and we have to look at our timeline and strengthen it out. We know that that is coming. The time of Jacob's trouble is coming. We know that Christ is going to come. We look forward to his soon and imminent return. And the thousand years spent in heaven and the judgment afterwards and the earth made new. We know about that. So the thousand years spent in heaven and the time of Jacob's trouble, which could be between three years and seven years. And the plagues of Egypt will return. We know this. So this is in our future timeline. But I would say that, and again, I'm, trying to make this as a final point, that if you would get anything from this discourse and the presentation, what I'm trying to even, you know, impose upon people and just impress upon people, it's the duty to the next generation. You have a moral duty that we cannot allow for our current history to stand. We need to examine. And one way to do that is to work on this timeline. My timeline, which is available on the Facebook, you could go back and it's there fully. Everything I've said is back on Facebook. It's not perfect. I mean, it's my first draft. But we need to examine these points in history and tell the story. Because it, there's no way it's impossible for this world to be more than 6,000 years old. Dr. Jensen, from a scientific part of, point of view, he looked at the Y chromosome uh, analysis, the mutations of the Y chromosome, which is stable over time, 5,000 years. Even historians and himself, he looked at ancient civilizations, the oldest structures that of man are around five to 6,000 years old. And if we can pigeonhole the timeline and put it into perspective, then questions of inequity. Why do we have to be depreciated? 
Why are we not more valuable? Why aren't we truly equal at the foot of the cross? And why are these paintings and images in our faces every day? We need changes to be made because the young ones are very impressionable. And the older ones and the persons who don't have the academic qualifications and the status in life, they need some sense of hope and belonging and connectivity with their world. Otherwise, you're going to have, when you say the chicken's coming home to roost, you're going to have a world with all the persons jailed. They have a perfect formula for utter chaos in the years to come if they don't deal with it. Because you have these millions and millions of Blacks that have been locked up and coming out into a world. They need ministers like yourselves. They need persons to reach them. And how do you reach them? You may not be able to uh, give them a dollar and the reparations checks that everyone is yearning for. But before these reparation checks are given, we need to give them hope and the scripture. And what better way to present it in an evangelistic tool than a timeline connecting them with history, their black true history, and showing them that they too belong and they fit in to the picture. And it could be any color, white, black, but our brown and black brothers who need help. They are, a lot of them lost, a lot of them turning to gangs and violence for the answers and drugs. And we need to save as many of our brothers and sisters as possible. And that's why I dwell on that because this is a men's meeting. This is a fellowship meeting. And this is a tool, one tool in the arsenal, one arrow in the quiver that you can use as a tool in order to help the next generation to, 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 to belong and to connect with the scripture and to know that they're just not serving some austere, some, you know, Jesus who's in his clouds who doesn't love them or belong, but looks like them. And he represents all people. This is a message of inclusivity, not exclusivity. But it appeared that for many years, it is one that has been slanted and maligned and twisted for profit, for people, certain people to profit. But now that we are facing this uncertain future, which is going to impact and impacting us every day, we go to the store every day. We 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 need we need we need a new model. We need a new a new solution, and pray about it. Always pray pray about your solutions and your go in your prayer closet, and God will reveal to your mind how you will be able to reach and touch the lives of your fellow man. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry I took so long, but I just uh, again wanted to 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 share as much as I as I could. So I'm I'm up and for any we questions. We can see your passion, and we appreciate the passion and the presentation. And um, well, what a history that you have discovered. You know, we know that we have not been told the full story, and uh, lots of people have been conspiring against the black race over the ages, but your presentation makes us feel proud to be black, eh? <laughs> All Amen. right. Well, I know um, uh, we still will want to give a little time. I know we're pushing past our regular time, but um, I'm sure uh, folks would want to do a feedback and uh, maybe ask a question or two. So let me see. You can raise your hand and um, come right in. Dr. Carrington, his hand is up. You can go ahead, Dr. Carrington. All right. Thank you. Please monitor that for me. Okay, Dr. Carrington, then Paul, then uh, Virgil Sams. Dr. Carrington? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. McDowell, for an intriguing presentation. Um, I 
I, I'm only going to focus in my question on the timeline issue. Says so that's the main thing that you that we're that we're talking about uh, that you were talking about this evening, and I I want to ask then in view of the uh, uh, six thousand twenty four or whatever the thing was uh, the timeline that you're outlining there, um, uh. What do you how, how do you confront those people from the scientific community who uh, base their uh, timelines more on dating systems and uh, how does that uh, figure in to this because uh, you, you, as you'd quite well know you're, you're, you're a scholar and I would expect you that you'd know this there are uh, dating systems that date fossils, and human fossils have been found that date more than um, uh, 6,000 years. And, uh, and and other fossils have also been found that date even uh, allegedly old, older than that. And as a consequence, uh, that's what sort of creates the rift between the scientific community and the biblical community. When I was younger and I was attending college, um, we had um, lots of input into this and there was a big dichotomy because i grew up believing in the six thousand year uh, stuff and that when um uh, uh when y2k came that the world would explode or something bad would happen but obviously nothing happened at that time um I, i'm saying it in a sort of sly way but not meaning it that way but uh but but yet we have um other methods of calculating uh, timelines uh, yeah. other than the Bible's timeline. So and, can, you, can you tell us how, yeah. how you resolve that? Yeah. I'm, happy, I'm happy to deal with this on the multiple fronts. And this is it, where everything that I've seen in my work and research, everything that I've seen, it points in one direction. It's like I've been awakened. Like in the movie Matrix, I've been awakened, and and I have been studying. Even we have no television growing up. I, I, I don't know. We have no <laughs> like that. So we I read a lot. So when I see that the DNA companies are telling me that I am this, my dad is twenty percent Scott Irish, but then I am zero, and then they give the percentage to my mom, who is full Indian, ninety eight percent Indian, but they're making her one hundred and twenty percent Indian. I don't know a person who could be 120% of anything. And I see there's so many anomalies. So I'm seeing the gaps. So I could look at from a science, from a test that I can connect with almost everyone with my DNA group. I can connect with them in my tree. And I have a tree that's 600 and um, almost near 20,000 in size. And I can go all the way through the Davidic lines all the way up even literally to Adam. And I, I'm, I make no apologies. I could go there, but connecting through not a direct line, there's no way I can just get a direct lineal sort of path, but a, a DNA match, triangulated match with the Yaya, with Davidic lines. So through my uh, own little microcosm, my little model, and what I've seen and unearthed by my DNA findings and studies and going to the, to the outback in, in, in Australia, I am I'm convinced throughout from the DNA as evidence. And then, of course, the scientific evidence is Dr. Jensen. He's looked at the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is very stable. It mutates one in one difference every, every year, each year, one difference. And if you multiply the differences out, you'll get 5,000 plus years. But your question about science, um, as I said before, it's hard to, I'm not looking at dating the world. The earth can be millions of years. Genesis 1, whether you say that God created or recreated the world, and there's a school that he recreated the world, and there was a blue or yellow man or something before, look, I, he created the world in Genesis, but his spirit moved across the deep. And reread chapter 1 of Genesis. What was that? Was there signifying that there was something kind of there and he added to it? Again, that is something for another day, another period. But when God created this world, no one could tell me there are some trees today, if left alone, they can grow for 20,000 years. Okay, they could grow for a long time. When God created this thing, how old was it? But I'm it not talking about the world so much. It could be 100,000 years old, but he created it in mature, pristine, magnificent form. And if you have this creation which has undated matter 
and it's washed around in a cataclysmic event, in a flood event, 1600 years later, it's, um, it's impossible to separate the created from the uh, pre-existing matter, post-creation matter. It's impossible to just separate I agree. it I, I agree with that. But I'm not talking about the things so much. I'm talking about human fossils being found in areas that you would not expect them to be found or carbon dated to be ages older than that. That's what I'm talking yeah. about most. Well, well the, the, like the flood event was not a local, let's see, the flood event was not just a local event. It was a, it was a global event. The flood event was a global, global event. It was truly a global event. And everything you said got mixed around to the point where it just, you know, got combined. It's hard to unravel something that has been completely uh, at different layers of the earth, just completely flipped. I mean, you all know, ask yourself, why is it that the Middle East has so much oil? It has so much oil because the earth was so green and lush in all the Middle East. That's the cradle of civilization. And whatever you saw above got flipped in some way, manner, built. You know, why is so much oil? Oil is a hydrocarbon. Oil would be the dead plants and animal life that got flipped. So when getting in flipped, you may see a, a, a human, someone who lived in the antediluvian world, and his bones is found in North America. I don't know where and how that came about, but that came about because of the cataclysmic, violent nature of the flood. The, the, the sea, you have to understand the flood. The flood wasn't just water and rain falling. I the agree flood with that. was I that subterranean that. channels were erupted and burst, and it created this place where whatever was above was flipped below. This is what why there's so much oil in that region. It, and it's desert. On the top side of it, it's sand dunes and desert. But on the bottom of it, it's rich with oil. And, and, that, and that, for me, is my explanation for why. But, you know, we to unravel how the bones got shifted another location, that is for, you know, it's really this for model. People could come and say, how did this come about? But the dating of it, it's skewed because when God created the world, he just did not create things at uh, aged at year one. He would have created in his infinite wisdom. He created a tree, and this is a mature tree that is 50,000 years old. And I, I confront these guys with it, and I said, you know, a divine creator that's created matter, he created an, it in a manner, an age that is beyond the 6,000 years. But there's so much evidence that points to a 6,000 year period. But the reason why people want to drag it out is that, and this is my research, I match with a lot of Caucasian looking, white looking men. So if my ancestor, which is 900 years ago, was around, so he, you know, put him in Africa, he was swinging from tree. That means my white brothers had their cousins and they were swinging from trees too at 900 years ago. You see, this is the thing. They want to space it out as far as possible so that Alice, the, you know, I don't the blacks do not belong almost anywhere. We don't belong in Africa. We don't belong in the USA. We belong nowhere. And the land is theirs. That's the kind of fraud that's been taking place for so long and too long. This, this is it. So it's a, the dating of it, hydrocarbon and, and half life and, and testing is not going to work. It's not going to prove out creation. I have to look to my DNA evidence. I have to look at population studies because if the world was 200 million and you telling me that the world is not two, two, uh, 6,000 years, but you tell me the world is 1 million years old, how can you have 200 million people living at a time of Christ? Then it went through to 600 million, and then it jumped to 1.7 billion in 1900, and today the population is 8 billion. You see that progression of human humanity. How come, if you put the timeline at 100,000 years, even 10,000 years, even 10, number one, there are no structures. I visited some of the Neolithic sites at Orkney, Scotland. I took a plane and went all the way up to the tip of Scotland to Kirkwall. And I saw the domes. These cut stone domes are burial places of giants. 
And, and, and no one could tell me, there's only one scientist saying that, Graham Hancock. You could Google him, Graham Hancock is saying that these domes that are cut from stones were burial spots for giants. But the Smithsonian and the, and the Institute don't have any giant bones. I can show you 20 articles where it discussed the findings of giants, people over 20 feet, people over 30 feet. But that, that is nowhere. We have no skeletons, no remains. It proves part of the Bible, the part they took out, the Nephilim. Um, I, look, I, I, this is something that I know mainstream Adventists don't believe in, don't prescribe in, but they were giants. They were huge men. I'm not talking about a Shaquille O'Neal seven-footer. I'm talking about 20, 30, 40-foot people that lived and helped build the pyramids and were largely black people. As most people of the earth were black, 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 brown, black, shades of black, oh. but black. All right. All right, Dr. Mac Dr. Sarada, uh, we have five hands and we have 10 minutes to 6.30. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I'll go. I'll speed it up. I'll okay, speed it up. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, it's <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yes. So okay, if we can ahead. keep the answers and the questions quite succinct, or okay. unless, Doctor, we have your permission that we can go beyond 6.30. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I, for me, I have the time. I have the time. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, let's take Paul, then Virgil, uh, and then Dennis. Go ahead, Paul, quickly. Thank you, Doc, for your information. Um, you know, I, I I believe the Bible is one of, if not the greatest history book. Um, prophecy have proven that we can trust the word of God. Here's my problem. You know, um, to me, in the circumference of our doctrine, uh, uh, there are some things that doesn't make sense to me. That should make sense, as you just explained about timeline and so forth and so on. There are certain things that have to make sense. And there are certain doctrines within our organization that doesn't make sense. Do you think they should make sense? Um, to, to answer your question, they should make sense. They should make sense. And we, again, because... The, the word has been described and communicated in a certain way. It has been. We need to come together as brethren, right? I, and I'll tell you something. I even sent basically uh, an offer on my Facebook um, page that if anyone can show me any new writing of Ellen White, I would pay them a $10,000. And, and it's a real offer <laughs> from a lawyer. Um, we, we need... We need to establish truth. So $10,000 to anyone who could show me um, about a, a, an image of Christ that is colored, a, an image of Christ. We, I think we could do it in a sensible way. We have a lot of people who are paid and connected to the church, and we have a certain understanding of how things, even the books from Review and Herald that we see, the pictures don't make sense. I cannot accept that. And you know what I end up doing? All the little kids, I end up coloring them when I have my kids. I have the books that I use, my, my Bible friends, and I have been coloring over some of the photos, and I have my kids here because I'm trying to raise them for the next generation. And, and, and I think we have to just do it in a sensible way. We have scholars here. We have prominent people on board, Dr. Wellington, other people. And I want to do this in an organized way. We have a certain concept of the world and how the church has presented the message. Um, I am not trying to go against the grain, but a lot of it has not focused attention on the needs of blacks, of the minorities. Ellen White tried to do it and they sent her packing to Australia. I am tired of it. When I went to Andrews University, there was the PMC, the white church and the little Negro church. I am sick. And tired of this. And I can talk this way because my father is retired and I can speak a little, but I'm speaking among white people that I am tired of this nonsense. And it gets to me that the point that my head physically, I am unwell. And your know, God helps me, really, just speaking amongst like minded people. This is enough, is enough. We, it affects our pockets. Nowadays, you go to the grocery store. I went to Cayman, I spent $600 for grocery. Why? And, you know, this is it. Income matters. Not everyone can be a lawyer and make lawyers income, but you get paid based on color. 
The man from London will come down and he's not making half a million dollars. Maybe in a year I could clear half a million. That's good. God bless me. But he comes from London. He gets paid $2 million. And it goes at a scale, goes down the right. I'm, I'm sick when I say I'm sick. I'm sick and tired of racism. And it's coming from that nasty green book I just showed you. They have the Aryan philosophy and it's all trumped up. It's lies. I just read you what the Moor said about whites. I love my wife to bits, 19 years married, but the belly's protruding. Let that get into your brain that that is how the caucus people looked like, nearer animals than men. And we have been governed. We have been lied to. We have been show, we, this, 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 and in a context that you say, oh, well, you know, Ellen White knew some books were taken out. And I want to see some new books come about from the estate. But the Adventist church was started 20 years after slavery. And I put a point on Facebook too. You couldn't drink from a white water cooler, but yet the black women were suckling white babies for four, 400 years. And I give it, you know, you know who doesn't get credit? Black women. At Elder Wellington, I, I met his wife for the first time, and I, I'm drawn to her. Black women haven't been credit credit because black women have the most complex, complete DNA in the world. And the black women were forced to suckle the white babies because they were dying. That mama's milk was sustaining them. It was passing on nutrients. And they knew from then why it was necessary to do that, sustain themselves. You know what? This this is truth, man. This is truth 101. I I, I can't dial it down. You, you have the PMC at Andrews, the white church, the black church. I, I I can't I can't take it. And it's nonsense. The way we present ourselves, we are equal for the cross, but at the end of the day, dollars and cents and status. Chris Rock said the black tax. You basically have to pay and present yourself in a manner that is so uh, well above the grade. And we know that. When it comes to the performance of black people, don't even talk about sports. Don't talk about those other things and the intellect. Oh no, in the in the Air Force, black people couldn't fly a plane in 1940 because we couldn't see good at night. Have mercy, have mercy. You know, I mean, you know, it gets it gets to the point that I just feel unwell. And the people know the truth. Oprah knows the truth. People who are of means know the truth, but they are corrupt by the current Jewish monetary system that is there as a lawyer and a banker and a, an accountant. There's a certain monetary system that's in place and those people are not Semitic. There's a book about the 13th tribe of Jews. They're not Semitic people. The original people, and I, I have taken away the Jewish reference of all of my social media. I call myself the Hebrew because we are Hebrews, haplo group A, B, C, D, go and do the test. I encourage everyone to sign up and do a male test. If you're a man, do the haplogroup test. My, my wife's um, son turned out he's an E. I'm an E. My dad is an E. And a lot of the ancient um, uh, Hebrews are E. A, B, C, D, and E. We have to know ourselves. And hanging in Poland helps me understand the people who are truly from the Caucasus. My wife and all of her family are of the H and R groups, and that is consistent. But they lie and say that the R and H groups are also Western Europe and America, and that's not true. They don't belong there. Their time stamp is shorter, and they belong here near the Caucasus. Slavs, slave, Slavs, oh no, they play on words. They, play, they love to play on words. Slav, slaves, they were slaves. And when they're coming across the mountains, the poor souls, they could not uh, make it over. They were sleeping on horseback for the whole journey because they were weak and couldn't even make it over the journey. They were sleeping on horse. They're literally sleeping on the horse because they could not make it. The signs and image of King Arthur, who's, that, that's a lie. King Arthur never existed. All those Ragnarok and Vikings and charging. You know what? Every time I see a Hollywood, Hollywood, no, Hollywood, Hollywood, no, call it a Hollywood movie. They, 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 they create these images and they're distortive, they're incorrect, and they're Luciferian. At the end of the day, it, it just boils down to it. I just say to myself, you have, you have Hebrew God, Yahweh, and Lucifer. You have door number one and door number two. Because everything else on all the religions, see, once we construct a timeline, 
all the other religions, they fall out. If you think about it, it's the most powerful tool I can think about. Because if you have a proper timeline that points to a Jewish Hebrew God, all the people studying Confucius and Buddha and uh, all these other religions, they fall away because the timestamp is shorter and it points in one direction to a Hebrew black God. This is the most powerful evangelistic tool that I could think about. And we have to prove out our own history because the history books have not done justice. And a lot of them have been removed. I can go on and on and tell you about Euphorus, a scholar in ancient Greece. 30 books are missing. The library at Alexandria burned down the Egyptian sphinx and most of the sphinxes and images defaced, nose off, lips chop off. In London, they have the black boy image of the King Charles II. They have a pub in London named after black boy. Now, he was extra dark, extra crispy. I don't know. But the, 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 the man's nose and face is gone. This is not Egypt. This is London. London. Lips and nose gone. And there are brooches coming out. I've seen pins where uh, Italy, France, and UK brooches of women adoring themselves in modern day or in medieval England with black faces, thick lips. And, you know, you wonder why would a white woman put a slave brooch on her chest? No, no, we are all vain. It's not a slave brooch. She was making an image of her own self and putting it on her chest as jewelry. So again, I, I hate to belabor the point. I hate, to, but it, it, a lot of things about history grieves me and it doesn't gel. So I, I, I'm sorry I took a little more time to, to explain it, but I'm a, I'm a night owl. I, in fact, I, I, best, I, sleep, I, I sleep at 2 a.m. somewhere they're around 2 a.m. They're clamoring for a part two. <laughs> okay, Virgil, Virgil let's, let's take the last four hands, Doc, uh, okay, and yeah, then we'll yeah, call it a yeah. night. Uh, Virgil, you can go ahead, then Dennis. Yes, sir, uh, Doc. Uh, Donald, I want to thank you very much for such an extensive research. It is very informative and very insightful. Uh, I just want to know quickly, um, is there a recording of this presentation? Uh, that yes, can be it, yes, it is. It, it, is, is, on YouTube. it is on YouTube. Oh, yeah? uh, Frank's talk in YouTube. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Dennis, go ahead, Dennis. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Madonna, uh for inviting me to this. Um, my question is, can you hear me good? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, my question is, uh, um, kind of in your presentation, if institutional uh, racism and kind of like from European scholars, you know, they've been handling the Bible, they've been teaching it, they've been, you know, based off the kind of the curse of him, uh, you know, and, and proper, you know, putting, the, putting, you know, Negroes in a certain place. When it comes to the timeline, do you think that that has, because um, I, I kind of constructed the timeline and kind of got similar results from you, you know, from Adam to uh, Messiah, you know, uh, uh, 4,000 years. Um, would you say, my question is, is do you think that um, that um, institutional racism has factored into um, the, the, the seven days, um, kind of theory, you know, one day is worth a thousand years, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of timeline. So, cause, cause in my timeline, it's like, we have like a thousand years, uh, left, you know? Um, but from, from <clears throat> modern day scholarship has been, you know, when we get to 6,000, you know, it's kind of the kingdom is coming. And, and do you think that has anything to do with okay. well, what is previously well, preceded? Well, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. And I get it. And I, 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 part, part of the Bible, of the Bible is, is written, in literal interpretation, interpretation for a scholar and for a theologian. But my take on it, the last thousand years is the millennium. We're going to spend actually 1,000 years. Um, the whole equivalent of one year, one day in, um, in, 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 in one year biblical prophecy is Revelation. I mean, Revelation is a book that's a little bit cryptic and, you know, deals with prophecy and Daniel as well, Daniel and Revelation. But my take is that there's literally a thousand years left, but we have entered, we've been the 6,000 years, um, but they're different calendars. You know, so Roman, Gregorian. So the last thousand years we'll spend in heaven in the millennium. So we're at the end and end, like the tippy toe of the image of Daniel. We are the final end of it all. That, that's my take. That's thousand years is not to go because really, truly, as I said, financially, my doctorate is in derivatives. We are 
50 times in the red. In other words, when you're looking at derivatives, okay, the derivatives, these instruments that they gamble with every day, we have 100 trillion in gross domestic product. If we add up all the goods and services this planet can offer, we have 100 trillion. They're gambling with five to eight quadrillion of derivatives. That's 5,000 trillion to 8,000 trillion. It's, it's, it's insane. And I don't understand. It's like the, the world is bankrupt. So we are the end of it. And how we experience this end and put it to an end, well, we all need to come together and right those wrongs in a peaceful way, in a respectful way, in a professional way. But we can do this because we have that truth. And the more of us that will test, if you go ahead and do your haplogroup testing and the more of us test, we will break that model. I, I see these people in my work do all the time. They create new records. They cannot, when I test with someone and match with someone, they make me an orphan. My parents are matching, but then I'm, I'm matching that person. There are a lot of anomalies, but more of us that are entering the system as haplogroup E's, and most of them are of us are E's and A's, we will break that system and that mold. Um, but yeah, the time re reference you mentioned about Bible, we don't have a thousand years to run. I think most theologians, even on this call, would agree we, we are at the towards the end. We, we are at the end of it all. Good. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Doctor Holness? And then Le Leah, that, that would be our final uh, question. Go ahead, Doctor Holness. Hey, Doctor McDonald, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Good, good. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm looking for my question here. Um, you just said it so much. I think you need a part two. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask, let me ask this question. This one, I think, uh, uh, yeah, let me ask this question about um, with your background in law and um, your background in law and finance, I had put a question down about the whole concept of um, the new world order. Is this an outdated concept or does it currently exist? And what's the main purpose for establishing the new world order and how does it relate with prophecy? Okay, uh, then. See it um, now, as, so. as, as an accountant, and I'm also a liquidator. So when companies go under, I also help to dissolve those companies. The world, as I said, the stats, they don't lie. We are at $100 trillion in GDP stacked with about uh, six to eight a quadrillion, 6,000, 8,000 trillion of uh, this toxic instruments and debts. So the whole world needs to be restructured. Whether we like it or not, the whole world needs to be structured because we are 50 to 100 times bankrupt. When a company has no capital, it's insolvent. So we are insolvent. This new world order, everything is in place for the end. Uh, from a legal perspective, I want the theologians to understand that the European Union is a separate body. From 2009, the Treaty of Lisbon made the European Union. Remember, we're in prophecy. We're looking at the Daniel prophecy, head of gold and going all the way to feet and brass, iron and clay. We are the tippy tippy toe of the toenails because the European Union... Those tribes, the only surviving tribe of the Germanic tribe was the Franks, the Frankish Empire, the Merovingian kings, they came. And now today we have the European Union. So 2009, the European Union is a separate body. So whether any member departs, even UK departed, they say bye-bye because they couldn't pay 5 billion euros a year. <laughs> okay, they, buy, it is, they left. But they gave away their bundle of rights already. The right to coal and steel, to nuclear energy. All these are harmonized in the European Union and it's done away with already. It's vested in a separate body preparing for the end. They have their own monitor. I'm not into the Bitcoin and nonsense with, you know, with fin fintech and stuff. Look. I don't bother that because all that stuff is garbage and don't have any weight. There's no one backing that. But they have their own monitor instruments called SDRs, special drawing rights. And you can Google that they have it in place. So when the system crashes, they have something there already to uh, give us some electronic form of money. But they have a new system in place. It's just going to fall into place. We're at the very end. 
This is like the very end. We just need the white washing of Pentecost for us to, you know, get ready for Christ's return. We're, we're at the very end. We, we, we were way past uh, the final frontier. We were way past it. We, we were at the very end. Okay, uh, Leo? Greetings. Um, gratitude for the, the lesson. I did post my question in the chat, but I'll just kind of repeat it. Okay. Um, so my question was, I noticed that you said that our DNA was mutated. And I just wanted to get a little bit more information on how exactly that happened. And, um, no, I what was it? What was, sorry, you repeat what? You said repeat? like our DNA or... I think it was our DNA or oh, yeah. our DNA chromosomes. Mutated. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so I wanted um, to get a little bit more information on how exactly that occurred. Um, if all these other races didn't exist at one point, where exactly <clears throat> did they come from is my question. Okay. So this is it. From based on the work that is done by Nathaniel Jeanson, PhD in microbiology at Harvard, for 20 years he's been studying, and he published a book called Traced. And in that book, he comes with a flow genetic tree, and that flow genetic tree maps out all the DNA haplogroups and boxes from E. It starts at E, not A. It's not fully alphabetic, but A, B, C, D, E. I'm an E. Most people are E's. But black melanated people, and those are the first groups, the primary groups of mankind, or black Adam, black people, black Hebrews in the beginning. Now, what happened, or we could surmise from Enoch and an extra biblical book, the Nephilim DNA came about, whether that was inserted or whatever fallen angel went to bed, whatever happened, but they came about, the giants came about, but they were killed in the flood. There were no giants on the ark, 2400 BC. You had uh, eight people in the ark. Uh, Noah was described by his father, Lamech, as a albino, because even then he had to go to Methuselah. Or this is a child is looking, looking like the angels. So uh, we, Noah was albino, but his wife was black. He waited 500 years to be married, <laughs> 500 years. And for me, that's the part of God's creation, why he caused the flood to happen. What grieved God to me the most was that his crowning achievement, God's son was supposed to come through the line from Adam, and it was being distorted in some crazy white looking giants who were monstrous. So they were eliminated. Noah was albino. His wife was black. The children were black. All of them were black. So this curse of ham nonsense is garbage. Uh, all of them were black. But after the flood, the world was so toxic. The world was filled with methane gases and everything, and it caused our lifespan to be shortened. The people lived from 900 years, they went down to 600, 500 years. And that toxicity caused our DNA to mutate rapidly. And in mutating, all the groups came about. And people's changes, faces would be changed depending on how much of that Nephilim DNA they got. But the population still remained black. And black was a solid color. Up to 1700, when Ben Franklin wrote his essay. And I don't understand why a lot of people have not found it. But it is open government, open source essay, paragraph 24. So this, is, this, this changes. And it, it dovetailed with the languages and Babel. Babel was about 200 years after the flood event, so 2200 BC. And Babel, they scattered the nations and they took with them their different faces and different DNA throughout the world and the language was confounded. So there again, the Bible has answered a lot of questions. You can put a black man in Antarctica for the next thousand years. I guarantee his nose and his mouth and whatever not gonna change. I, I, the climatic conditions that they describe, no. It had to have come from some other intervention, which, you know, that, that was uh, proliferated and accelerated in that harsh post-flood environment. But the genes, it stabilized. It didn't keep mutating. 
We don't have too many of that going on right now. But you know what? There's a form of mutation today, which is cancer. And cancer affects all of us. But it seemed that it affects less melanated people. Melanin, melanin, and this is part two. Melanin is a biochemical. So it's not just what's on your skin, but what's in your bones, what's in your muscles, in yourself. I've been with medics. Melanin is a biochemical. The more melanated you are, the more human you are. That, 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 that is what doctors have decided. And you know what? It, it makes sense to me. It's just, that's the way it is. It, it, this is why those right. babies had to be um, breastfed by black women, strong black women for 400 years. Those babies were nursed at the breasts of black women. Um, <laughs> it, it's fascinating history, but you know, it's stuff that we, we need to rediscover. And we have to be confident with what we know because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Dr. Wellington, back to you, sir. Well, well, we have been treated this evening. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of Friends Talking, uh, Dr. MacDonald, for this intriguing, interesting uh, presentation uh, based on your research. And it's interesting that you have even found your own linkages all the way back, um, which gives some authenticity, I believe, to, um, to, to what you have presented. And um, we, can, we can see a lot of what you're saying to be reality. Um, some of it we need to think a lot more about and, and, and understand because we haven't done the research, but uh, it's interesting, and uh, the folks are interested in having a part two. And <laughs> I, be I believe you will oblige. <laughs> yes, yes. There's so much more to share on the scientific side, and I call them the orphan files. Those are the files, 600 of them, where the DNA companies say that I'm an orphan. My parents are on the system, but they say that I'm not a match. My parents are not a match with the subjects. It, 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 it's and the Jews own these platforms, and I'm tired of this. I'm really tired of it. The 13th tribe, 13th tribe, they're not Semitic. They're not Semitic, but you know that's for another time. Uh, we are Hebrews. If you're A through E, you're a Hebrew. And you need to know your past to understand your future. And that's really going to help our young ones. I mean, Cayman had its first public shooting at a football field. This gripped the nation. And I said, you know what? You could try and talk to them, give money. But if you awaken in them a sense of pride and decency that they're connected to just 300 years ago, they were kings, black kings on the world, not millions, out just 300 years ago. This changes our perspective. This just changes all the way we think about ourselves and our view ourselves and feel about ourselves. And we need that. We need that empowerment. And it's sad that we, but look, we, we still have time. Just get it done. Do yeah. this individually, collectively. I'm happy to come back again. Thank you very much. And uh, folks, um, the, the session is recorded. And um, can you post the link, um, Marcel? Yes, I will, Doc. I will. All right. And so that folks can get back to it. There are some questions, unanswered questions in the, in the chat. Uh, we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. But there will be a part two. Thank you very much gentlemen and ladies for taking the time, participating and asking your questions. And, um, and suffice it to say, we have had a great evening and um, we look forward to another presentation. Uh, Carlo, if you're there, we're going to ask you to um, do the prayer uh, to close. Is Carlo there? We have stepped away. He stepped away. Well, pa Pastor, since we have a, a lady with us, uh, uh, All Lily, right. yeah, Mick, could we ask you to pray for, to close us out, please? Certainly. Lilia, could you pray for us to close? Yeah. 
you if you're there then you you're muted uh, may, maybe she stepped away all right um let me try again dr sams virgil yes sir all right there you are um, I'm sorry that my I have some issues with my camera. That is why my camera is not on at the moment. But, okay. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And feel free, everybody, to join us on Sabbath, 4.30. Uh, Gratitude. Gratitude. Ah, of and our, Yeah. All right. Leah is back. Okay. So uh, thank you, Doc. Leah, could you dismiss sure. us, please? Gratitude. It was very informative, and uh, look forward to the next the next class. Have a good good evening. Thank you. Prayer. Could you dismiss us with prayer? Oh, I don't. I don't do that. My apologies. Oh, you don't do that. Then no, I don't. <laughs> okay. All right, Dr. Sams, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Our Father and our God, we're indeed thankful for the privilege of being on this platform to hear this extensive research and informative and insightful presentation. We are thankful that you bless Dr. McDonald with such insight from his research, and we are thankful that for his willingness to share with us. And I pray, Lord, that the information received will help us in our spiritual growth, that it will help us so that we will become wiser and more effective in our service to humanity. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here, and I pray your blessing upon all. Continue to bless Dr. McDonald with continued wisdom, as he continue to carry out his work and that all that he do may it bring glory and honor to his, to your name bless his family uphold them with your mighty hand we pray in jesus name amen amen <clears throat> amen let's share what we understand <laughs> to the next generation <laughs> amen god bless amen. have right, a great week people, everybody as yet okay no it's then not posted as yet it will be posted later on was... Later on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good night, okay. everybody. It was nice. Have a Here great week. God bless. God bless. I'm seeing old, see old friends. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Doc. Thank Blessing. You, Doc. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good okay. job. Bye -bye. Good job.